On Ireland's greatest robberies, we look back at some of the biggest heists to have ever taken place in this country over the last 35 years. Nobody at the bank knew that by the end of the day this would go down in history as the most infamous bank in Belfast and would be the most audacious raid in the history of bank robberies nearly in the world. It was so well executed. The FBI were involved, Scotland Yard were involved, Interpol were involved, the Dutch police were involved, even the Turkish Secret Service were involved. Drop the gun! We examine how these raids were constructed, from the precision planning through to their execution and aftermath. Get out of there! Get out of there! They carried out what is so-called tiger kidnappings. This is where you would stalk your prey like a tiger would and use your victim then to get the money out for you. The gang held the family overnight. They absolutely the fear of God into them. These robberies were masterminded by some of Ireland's most notorious criminals and many remain unsolved to this very day. It would have been a regular who's who of South Dublin crime at the time, the likes of Martin Cahill and Christy Dutton. They had the skill set required and they had the will to carry it out. Tonight on Ireland's Greatest Robberies, we examine how one of Ireland's stately homes, Rusborough House in Wicklow, became the subject of one of the greatest art heists this country has ever seen. Having previously been targeted by an IRA gang in 1974, in 1986, the house once again fell victim to thieves, when 18 of its most valuable paintings were stolen. Rusborough House is situated in Blessington, County Wicklow, and is reputed to be the longest house in Ireland. From end to end, it runs for 700 feet. In 1952, a wealthy businessman called Sir Alfred Bice spotted Rusborough House in a country magazine. As was his like, he decided to buy it and lived in the house for a number of months throughout the year with his wife. A keen collector of expensive art, Sir Alfred used the house to store his valuable art collection, comprising works by many great artists. When Sir Alfred Bight, who was from a very powerful South African uh, mining family, the huge interests of a very, very wealthy family, he was also a Conservative MP in the United Kingdom. He moved to live in Rusborough House in the late 50s and with him he brought the Byte collection. The Byte collection contained, they were all Dutch masters, uh, Metsu, Vermeer, but Vermeer's lady writing a letter was one of only two in private hands in the world at the time. And the other private owner was Queen Elizabeth. And that Vermeer was worth about 20 million pounds back in 1985. Now, the collection was originally formed by his uncle, Alfred Bight, the first Alfred Bight, who, with Cecil Rhodes uh, back in the 19th century, formed the De Beers Diamond Mining Company, which was a fabulously uh, profitable business. And so he uh, would have been today, we would have called him a multi-billionaire. So he used a lot of his money to buy art. But Sir Alfred uh, Bight bought Rusper House in 1952 and restored it to keep his collection in, and uh, we're very grateful that he did. With such valuable items being kept at Rusborough House, it was somewhat surprising that Sir Alfred Bice and his wife managed to live there peacefully for 22 years. However, in the spring of 1974, that was about to change. A young English debutante called Rose Dugdale, who had rebelled against her wealthy upbringing and joined the provisional IRA, targeted Rusborough House. When the provisional IRA hit it in 1974, it was hit by Rose Dugdale. She was the millionaire heiress, an English woman who was radicalized, I suppose they'd say now, and uh, came over here and embraced the ideals of the Republican ideals and uh, hung out with the provosts and their drinking haunts and became uh, a diehard 
an absolute committed Republican. On the night of April 26, uh, 1974, Rose Dugdale and uh, three male IRA members um, called to Rusborough House and tied up Sir Alfred Bate, who was 71 years old at the time, and his wife, and proceeded to target the paintings. Following the art raid on Rusborough House, the IRA made a ransom demand in an attempt to have four members who had bombed London transferred to prison in Belfast in return for five of the most important paintings they had stolen. These attempts were unsuccessful and the vast bulk of the paintings were covered out of property in County Cork and Rose Dugsdale was subsequently arrested and was later sentenced to eight years in prison. Twelve years after the IRA robbery of Rusborough House, the house once again became the target of a criminal gang. A gang who were becoming infamous for their many armed robberies throughout the country. At the helm of this ruthless gang was a man who was well known to the Gardaí, Martin Cahill, otherwise known as the General. Martin Cahill was unique, uh, and that's perhaps the best word to use to describe the man in a nutshell. He was an extremely complex, complicated man of many, many contradictions and many, many aspects. On one hand, he was absolutely adored and loved by his family and his associates. On the other hand, he was a complete psychopath. What also marked him out from the rest of the pack, so to speak, in the whole pantheon of, of criminal godfathers we have seen in this country in the past 40 years, is that he, more than anybody else, took his war to the state. He went after the state every opportunity he got. Growing up in several tough parts of Dublin in the 1950s and 60s, along with his 15 brothers and sisters, the Cahill family had very little money, leaning Martin toward a life of crime from an early age. Martin Cahill grew up in a place called uh, Hollyfield Buildings. And from a sociological point of view, it was perhaps in the 1960s, the last remaining squalid tenement complex in Dublin. That became effectively like a citadel for him. It was his castle, it was his kingdom, it was his stronghold. He only cared about the people from Hollyfield Buildings. He described one time to Michael O'Higgins, who now is a very eminent senior counsel when Michael was a journalist, how if you were at night, if you had a camera or you were able to look down on Hollyfield from a great height, it was like a little anthill because you could see all the little figures moving out of the anthill to go and rob and steal and burgle and do whatever they had to do. He grew up in that environment and literally they had nothing. They went out to rob, to steal food. And a number of his early convictions was it were doing exactly that. Stealing no more than bring home something to the family. And at a very tender age of 11 or 12, he finished up getting a two-year stretch in Dangin. Now that formed de young Martin Cahill. He was introduced to armed robbery by the Duns, in, and the Duns were the first family of the, cons, the, the phenomenon we call organised crime in Ireland. But they introduced around 76, they introduced Cahill, because they grew up beside Cahill, the Duns. Um, they introduced him to armed robbery, brought him on a job in Rafarnham, and he loved it and he had a great flair for it. In 1986, Martin Cowell and his gang had not committed a robbery in over a year, and the crime boss was becoming anxious for his next big payday. However, with the Gardaí watching him closely, Cowell had to be sure that his next job would be worth his while. In 1986, Martin Cowell came up with the idea to rob Rusper House. He was closely linked to a criminal called Paddy Shanahan, who was a former auctioneer and builder who had turned to a life of crime, but also had interest in robbing um, stately homes and the like. And Shanahan had expressed the opinion to Cowell that Rusper House would be an easy target with so much high value art and other goods in the property. Paddy Shanahan was unusual in criminal service because he'd gone to university for a year or so. He was a well, relatively well-educated guy. But he wanted to be a criminal, and he got involved in crime through Henry Dunn and Christy Dunn of the Dunn family. 
and then he was introduced to Martin Cahill. And he was a wannabe criminal. He loved doing robberies, loved dressing up for robberies. Uh, very strange individual in a lot of ways. Shanahan always specialised in the theft of antiques, expensive anti antiques, Ming porcelain, stuff like that. So Shanahan, that was his speciality at that particular time in crime as well. He realised the value of, of antiques and such items. Now his plan was to go and hit Rusborough House and take that stuff, not to take the paintings. Martin Cowell went behind Paddy Shanahan's back when Shanahan visited England to look at some alarm systems. Shanahan had provided Cattle with uh, various plans in relation to Rusborough House and Cattle used the opportunity of Sh Shanahan's absence to visit Rusborough House on a number of occasions and also to uh, make many drives around Wicklow and to get escape routes and similar parts of the plan in place. Martin Cahill began to spend the majority of his time meticulously planning the art heist on Rusborough House, down to the finest detail. This was a precision job that would cement Cahill's reputation as a master criminal and essentially put him on the world map as a renowned art thief. Once Martin Cahill had decided to take on the robbery of Rusborough House himself, he spent much of early 1986 putting plans together for the raid, in order to leave no stone unturned, and most of all, no trace of evidence behind that could link him to the crime. Martin was known as the general, like I mean, and the reason he was regarded as the general was because, like I mean, the meticulous planning he put into the crimes that he committed. He himself would go out and he would carry out surveillance on any place that he was going to rob. And he would sit, if necessary, in a bush or a tree at night. He would sit in the dark all night long and watch the movements of a house that he intended to rob. Watch every light that went on in the house. Watch the movement of children as they came in and out, as teenagers came in and out. Uh, visitors to the house, car movements, you name it. He would everything uh, would have everything off to a T. Even if we only walk out with two of them, it's the most simple, easiest thing. Alarm system. Done. That's all it is. How would you know this? In the months leading up to the robbery, Cahill spent a lot of time travelling around the Dublin mountains on his Kawasaki Vista. He knew the mountains well having hidden many of the spoils from his previous robberies here over the years. Cahill studied the vicinity until he had a map of the area clear in his mind. He discovered a place in around February 1986 where to hide, uh, hide the paintings, located close enough to Rusborough House in the Dublin mountains, an ideal place to build a bunker. He built a bunker that was six feet deep, five feet wide, which had blocks around it, which very few of his gang members um, were even aware of. As well as planning where he was going to hide the paintings once he had completed the robbery, Cal began to pay regular visits to Rusborough House, which was open to the public. From Easter of 1986, Cahill visited the house every Sunday for approximately six weeks, often bringing along one of his trusted allies with him. Martin Cahill liked the idea of this robbery, an idea of robbery from Rusper House. He went down to have a look at it himself. He used to pay his pound to go in. It was open to the public. He went down and he staked the place out just by looking at the stuff and got to know what the paintings were about. He was not a man uh, with any education or um, great love of art. As we use the line in the movie, um, I don't know much about art, but I know what I like, to steal art. On his visits to Rusper House, Cattle meticulously studied where the paintings were. He was able to get a very good layout of the house in his head. And he was also able to explore escape routes to and from Rusper House from Dublin and, and other locations. They'd been going up and down for six or seven weeks 
and Cahill himself had cased all the paintings that were worthwhile. They knew how the alarm system worked, they knew where the nearest guard station was, how long it would take for Gardy to, to arrive at the scene, the risk that was involved, like, I mean, of getting caught. All of these things were taken into consideration. Is this the one we're going for? Yeah, it's just the one. Just you wouldn't think of it. He lifted up all the walls. In his naivety and stupidity, I suppose, and lack of worldview, was that he, he believed that there was a, an endless supply of eccentric tycoons around the world who would love to have and pay huge bucks for a Vermeer to hang in their basement in a secret chamber that they could just adore and look at them and, and enjoy for themselves. After several months of preparation, the night arrived for Cahill and his gang to carry out their raid. At approximately midnight on the 21st of May 1986, Cahill and his gang met here at the Sally Gap in the Wicklow Mountains, where he gave his accomplices some final instructions before making their way through the darkness to Rusborough House. They went down to Rusborough, and Cahill's plan was very simple, and it was very, it was, it was. It was ingenious in a lot of ways uh, because they took out a glass panel of a window and they purposely triggered the alarms inside. One of the gang went in because they, had al they already had a good idea of what, where the sensors were and all that kind of stuff. So they, de they, they deactivated the sensors. They hurriedly got out, put the glass back in, went out, hid in the grass. This was only a ruse to attract the, the Gardaí's. Once the alarm was activated, Gardaí from Bolton Glass uh, Station, which is located uh, about 20 miles away, eventually uh, responded to it. There was a thorough search done, or so they claimed, and they had satisfied themselves that there was nothing untoward happening. The Gardaí had left the grounds of Rossborough House confident that nothing was amiss. However, little did they know that a gang of men were waiting in nearby woods and were about to pull off one of the greatest art heists this country has ever seen. They nearly gone or what? I don't hear anything. Huh? They gone a long time. I don't hear anything. They don't be up this hour tonight. Fucking hell. What Cahill had done in the meantime was he had come across fields from the road from Ballymore Eustace and he had staked out the field, literally, with stakes at 50 yards intervals with little white plastic bags tied to the top of them. He had two stolen jeeps with the gang way back offside. When the police left, he gave them the shout, come on, and the guys drove up in the dark through the fields between the, the markers. So they followed the plan and they arrived in the house and they took their time, there were hours there. And they took the paintings, 18 of them, including the one he most wanted, the Vermeer, the letter writer. What's special about Vermeer is that he only, there are only 34 pictures in existence by, by Vermeer today. And at the time that the, this one was stolen, it was the only one in private hands unless you count the Queen's one as private hands as well, but now of course it's in the property of the state. And this particular painting is, there's nothing like it really to compare to it. It's, it's, it's the most valuable painting in Ireland today. And uh, if, I, if I was to auction it, uh, I would put 50 to 70 million estimate and I would not be surprised if it got 100 million. those paintings were due to be handed over to the state. Uh, he didn't want the state to have them. He, he saw them as uh, being, you know, a crude expression or a crude example of the wealth that the rich people, because he despised the wealthy and the powerful, because he came from the lowest rung uh, of the ladder as he saw himself and was very proud and happy to come from there. 
but these people represented the higher echelon of society and you know he decided that that was again another example of how we said well stuff them I'm going to uh, I'm going to deprive them of these looking at it from our perspective and from our values nowadays that hall would be priceless when you see some of the modern paint the paintings by Van Gogh and others going for 200 million I just shudder to think you couldn't put a price on it Once Cal and his gang had taken the paintings they wanted from Rusborough House, they loaded the expensive art into a stolen jeep that had pulled up in the grounds and quickly proceeded to make their getaway. He then left a number of paintings in the back of one of the stolen jeeps that were used as getaway vehicle. And he took the rest of them off up to the mountains and hid them in a, in a makeshift bunker that he'd built himself. It was at the time the second biggest art heist in the world. Uh, it put this character, this elusive character, the general on the world map, because everybody, the, whole, the entire art world was looking at this. This was an extraordinary development. Having dumped seven of the valuable paintings in Manor Kilbride, Cahill and several of his gang headed to the bunker that he had built here in the Dublin mountains prior to the robbery to hide the remaining 11 paintings. He had prepared weeks and months in advance. He drove into Kiliki, the mountains overlooking uh, the city of Dublin at the south side and he had taken two of his most trusted lieutenants, this is prior to the raid, to dig a trench. And they dug a trench four foot, five foot by five foot deep, four foot, five foot in length. And they brought up material, they lined it with plastic and blocks and had timber covering it and other material. So it was an extraordinary, clever hiding hole. After robbing the paintings, cattle drove about 10 miles to Manor Kilbride, where seven paintings were simply dumped in the grass. And then after this, he drove to the bunker, which he had carefully planned and built. And that's where he put the rest of the paintings. Although the heist had so far gone off without a hitch, it wasn't over yet. Cal was on his way from the Dublin mountains to his home in Rathmines when he was stopped by police in Terra Nure in South Dublin. After a robbery, a lot of the gang members went their separate ways. Cattle and one other gang member drove back together um, from County Wicklow to Dublin. But they were stopped in Terra Nure, which is close to where Cattle was living in Rathmines. There was a guard at checkpoint here. It was at this checkpoint that Cattle caused a scene when a guard uh, attempted to search him. Oh, what do you want? Just go on the bonnet, everything will be alright. If you just play it easy, it'll be alright. Do you see what he's doing to me? Do you see what he's doing to me? It's harassment, guard. You're always picking me. Why me? After this incident happened, Cattle drove straight to the nearby Ratmines Guard Station, where he made a complaint about police harassment to local guardy about the incident in Terranure. This was the curious thing. Every time that Martin Cahill showed up at Rat Mines Guard Station, you could be positive and certain that some massive stroke that he was going to be involved in was, was about to be or had been pulled. In the days following the Bite Art robbery, many police forces and units became involved in the search for the 18 stolen paintings and in bringing those responsible to justice. Initially, the 1986 robbery was thought by the police to be uh, uh, done to order and they actually thought the pictures had left the country and were somewhere in South America or in Russia or wherever, they had no idea where they were but uh, it transpired as, as we, we, we then discovered and really only discovered when Cahill himself started uh, trying to sell the pictures so it was discovered that he was the, the architect of it all. The paintings were left there for weeks and of course, word got around, the biggest manhunt, it, consternation, 
in government circles. The cabinet met an emergency and hundreds of detectives on the case, but truly nothing emerged. There was no shred of evidence to link Martin Cal. So meticulous and, and uh, had been his planning. Over the next 12 months, Cal spent much of his time trying to sell off the valuable paintings. However, due to their worth and fame, this was no easy task for the man who was ultimately expecting to make millions from his now infamous art heist. Several of Cal's accomplices believed that a jinx had been put on the bite paintings, as they brought the gang nothing but trouble. The ga gang members would tell you that the, the uh, bite paintings brought nothing but bad luck to the general and his gang, and ultimately brought them down and brought Cahill down. They became the subject of investigation by the FBI, Scotland Yard, Interpol, every law enforcement agency probably in the world had an interest in these because no matter where they went, anyone who came to them uh, were either someone acting on behalf of a law enforcement agency or war secret agents from a law enforcement agency trying to entrap them and catch them and because they were so difficult to sell. The most important thing with valuable paintings like this, not just the paint, but the second most important thing after the painting itself would be the provenance and the provenance is its history of ownership. So it's very important to know to get the provenance. The provenance is a direct line from the artist uh, who uh, owned it originally and uh, then who he sold it to and who that person passed it to or whatever. Jeez, look at the amount of attention we'll have to bring the Apollo says. Hello. Nobody knows where we are. What? Nobody knows where the paintings are. Maybe you think you're going to look in your basement. He knew he'd have difficulty offloading this hall. It would be extraordinarily hard to fence. Unlike other materials like gold and silver bars and jewellery. This is, this is traceable. Every art historian and every art uh, unit of police forces around the world flash around the world when there's a theft of art as, as important, as nationally important as the ones that Cal took. I said to you when we had that meeting, I said, right, how are we going to get rid of the paintings? Yeah. Jesus Christ, now, Nicholas, look, Nicholas, we get, sitting everyone there, knows why. Yeah. We'll never question we you. We can't get, but this, this is a situation this we can't get out of. While the paintings were perhaps easy to rob, they were extremely, very difficult to sell. And it was very, very hard to find a buyer, and this led to maybe a sense of increasing desperation in the months and years ahead for Carl and his gang. Well, no. They have to be cash in hand, like. Yeah. Of course, it's crazy. What, what have we got to do with the album? On August 29th, 1987, in an act of defiance against the Gardaí for pursuing him for the Rusbra art robbery, Martin Cowell broke into the offices of the Director of Public Prosecutions, which at the time was located here on Stevens Green in Dublin city centre. He stole a number of important files, including one on the death of his brother Paddy in 1986. These files would become valuable currency in the criminal underworld. Martin Cal, after the bite paintings, took a serious interest in the office of the DPP. It gives you some idea that of the, as I call it, the mastermind of this criminal called the General, that he would contemplate a break-in at the sacrosanct, hallowed offices of the DPP, the law officer of the state. Some months earlier, a man had been acquitted of murdering Cattle's brother in Ballyfermot, and there was a certain belief that um, Cattle felt very annoyed with the state. When Cattle broke into the office, he stole a, a large number of valuable, sensitive files which detailed such crimes as uh, armed robberies, burglaries, drug dealing, and in fact, many crimes that Cattle and his gang were involved in. Nobody in, that I know in, in the Guard of Shikana could specifically, or in the DPP's office, ever, ever stated just how many files he stole. Some say a hundred, some say three hundred, but it was a lot.
Martin Cattle had embarrassed the police force yet again and ultimately left them at the mercy of several figures from the criminal underworld. As a result, the Gardaí began to set up sting operations to bring the crime boss down once and for all. Martin Cahill had remained a free man since he stole 18 paintings from Rusborough House in May 1986. Several of the paintings had been located in countries such as Britain and France, but Gardaí still had no evidence to link Cahill to the crime. In September 1987, Gardaí decided that drastic measures needed to be taken, resulting in a sting operation with a Dutch fraudster, who, in return for charges being dropped against him, offered to come to Ireland and help bring Martin Cahill down. The uh, police got wind of another, the Dutch police now, got wind of another, of another sting uh, of trying to offload the paintings. And they had a, a guy on their payroll, a villain himself, called Van Schoik. And uh, with the aid of undercover Dutch police officers, they decided, yes, that they'd go ahead with this. And there was this extraordinary, detailed, perfectly worked out plan. I wasn't privy to it at that organization stage, only towards the end of it. But it was known as Operation Killikee. Van Schoek arrived in and he booked into the hotel and he was followed from the time he entered the country. Through the Dutch fraudster, a meeting was organised with Cahill's gang under the pretense of buying some of the paintings. On the 27th of September 1987, Operation Kill a Key was ready to go. The undercover officer acting as an art expert was brought up to the Wicklow Mountains by Cahill's close accomplice, where Cahill and several of his gang members were waiting. However, unbeknown to them, with the help of Scotland Yard, a British surveillance helicopter was hovering overhead and the Gardaí were waiting nearby to make their move. The plan was for the Gardaí to be able to arrest Cahill as he was in the process of selling paintings to the undercover agent in the Dublin mountains. This plan completely backfired in a very farcical way. The undercover officer on the ground was able to communicate with that aircraft overhead. So it looked good and there was a team of 30 men armed to the teeth of guard detectives waiting in Old Bond in town, near Bridget Burke's pub. I, I will take them, I, I'll definitely take no, them, but I, I, no, I, I've said that I would, but I just, that's you know, it's, it's, what are you doing? Whoa, 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 wait, 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 into the back of the car, kid. Fuck it in, we don't get our legs in. Things started to go very wrong when Cattle suspected that a police agent was in fact a policeman rather than an art expert and the deal was abruptly halted in the mountains and Cattle's associate Shava Hogan drove the man back to Dublin. Martin Cattle had once again escaped. Despite an aircraft hovering in the sky, surveillance, a team ready to hit, a pounce, and to make it even worse, he passed by that whole team of detectives near Old Bond just passed him by with his associate in the car. And they never, they never saw him. He just passed by and drove down into Red Mines. Following the failure of Operation Killikey, the first major expose about Gangland's elusive The General appeared on the front page of the Sunday World in October 1987. And it was this that made the Gardaí decide that further action needed to be taken to catch him. On the morning of December 2nd, 1987, a conference was held, and it was agreed that whatever resources were needed would go into taking down the ruthless criminal. They set up a tango squad, it was nicknamed a tango squad, and uh, this was made up of young eager Gardaí who were uh, brought in from stations throughout the city of Dublin, and it meant each of the criminals had a Tango nickname, like him. Martin Cahill was nicknamed Tango 1, and the others were then Tango 2, 3, 4, etc., right down along until you came to Tango 8 or 9 and 10. Basically, because of Superintendent Ed Ryan and a Chief Superintendent in charge of the city, a boat had seen the danger that Cahill posed to society, and both had been as vociferous and relentless in their campaign for a special unit to be set up to tackle the scourge of Cal and his gang. 
It was 24 hour, seven day a week surveillance. And it was round the clock, sitting under walls, sitting in under cars outside our homes. Everywhere they moved, if they got out and walked, if they got on a bus, any mode of transport, they were followed by the police, no matter where they went. So in other words, they couldn't operate, they suffocated them. But at the end of the day, it served its purpose. And a lot of the criminals that were involved with Martin and Cattle were caught doing robberies as a result of it. Since the setting up of the Tango Squad, approximately 10 of Martin Cahill's criminal associates had been imprisoned. Several of the bite paintings, meanwhile, still lay hidden in the Dublin mountains. Priceless artwork that had still brought the crime boss no money and relentless attention from the Gardaí. And so then it led to, I would say, at least about six or seven major attempts to lure Martin Cahill into a trap. And amazingly, his, he, he had an instinct a survival instinct that I've never witnessed before. He could sense when something was coming on top or about to come undone. And every time he was just about to get into the trap, he was nibbling around the edges of it. Uh, something told him, stop, go back. And he never got nicked with the paintings. But eventually they were all, they were recovered. Some were recovered in the UK, in Holland, like at, in various stages, the FBI were involved, the Scotland Yard were involved, Interpol were involved, the Dutch police were involved, the Belgian police were involved, even the Turkish Secret Service were involved. Uh, they're the agencies I can think of off the top of my head who were all involved in various efforts to retrieve the paintings. And they were all recovered over time. And Martin Cahill never got his money for them. Uh, there was also some pictures recovered in Turkey where he had uh, traded them with some UDA uh, people in the north of Ireland uh, and they went over to Turkey to try and sell them to a dealer but it was a setup and the Turkish police arrested them and found the pictures, I think they were the two Matsus. And, uh, and that actually in a way led to Cahill's death really because when the IRA discovered he was doing business with their enemies in the north. He was a marked man from then on. And so in a way, this robbery led to his own, his own demise. Eight years after his raid on Rusper House, Martin Cahill met his ultimate fate. On August 18th, 1994, he was brutally shot dead in his car here in the suburb of Ranela, South County Dublin, a short distance from his home in Cowper Downs in Rathmines. He was 46 years of age, and his killer remains unknown to this day. I don't think he was afraid. I don't think he had the capacity to be afraid. Um, if anyone crossed him, he took them on. He was certainly not afraid of the provision lawyer rate when everybody else would. Like, remember, the British Army, one of the most sophisticated armies in the world, were effectively at war with the provision IRA. And here was a, a fat, rotund, diabetic, semi-literate thug from Hollyfield buildings in Rab Mines prepared to take the might of the so-called IRA on. And he did effectively take them on. They were afraid of him and they backed down because he showed he had the bottle to take them on. And he had fellows around him who had the bottle to take them on as well, he had to shoot them. And I think ultimately that's what led to his death and they never forgot it. On the day that Martin Cahill met his maker, cars and detectives and motorcycles came from, from all over the city. It was an extraordinary evening that the enemy that we had hunted for so long was no more. The general had been gunned down, mercilessly assassinated in cold blood. The two men had waited for him, wearing corporation outfits with boards by the way, doing a traffic check. And as Ed Martin pulled up in his little car, they ran into the driver's door and they pumped bullets into him. And as the car was crossing the road out of control, crashing into the railings across the main road, they followed him and they pumped another two slugs into him. And I spoke to a gardener that evening who was working and he said they were smiling and laughing as they drove away. Rusborough House became the subject of two more heists in June 2001 and again in September 2002. 
Both raids were carried out by Dublin criminal gangs and all paintings were soon recovered and returned. Martin Cahill's heist on Rusborough House is to this day still considered one of the greatest art robberies in the world. And just as Cahill had wanted, the robbery cemented his name as one of the most renowned and ambitious criminals this country has ever seen.